Part three in our series, we call it Welcome Home because the journey of family does not end here, but it ends there where our Father wants to welcome us home where life really begins. We're going to be in the text that traditionally is known as the prodigal son, Luke chapter 15, and the story is about a father. Jesus is telling the story of a father who has two sons, and the younger one asks for his inheritance early, prematurely, and he goes out and spends all of it on immoral and irresponsible living. In verse 14, we pick up the story as we begin this morning. When he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Now when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And so he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to celebrate what an incredible story it's been taught numerous times over generations but to me this morning it's less about the prodigal son not so much about the older brother but the picture of our Heavenly Father and His extravagant, extraordinary, and exceptional love. Jesus is teaching this, I believe. He has many reasons, but one major reason is to use this parable to express what our Father in Heaven is really like and how deep and wide His love really is. We're going to go through four major gems this morning that I can pull out. There's more, but this morning on Father's Day, we're going to focus on four. Are you ready? Here's the first thing we grab. Humility before God leads to connection with God. So often over the years, I have friends or family members say, how do I connect in a relationship with God? Well, humility is a big word. Humility before God leads to connection with God. The prodigal son, the son, the younger brother says, I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's humility. So he's now done what he wanted to do. It didn't work out. He's descended and come to the place where he's at the bottom of the barrel and he's come to the end of himself. And how many of us know that's when humility kicks in, if we're wise? And so he is humble. What's interesting about this is as he makes the effort to approach his father, he finds the father has already been looking and waiting and longing and craving a connection with him. You realize that's how God our Father is with us? That even at the point of our most abject and miserable failure, God our Father, our Heavenly Father, loves us to such an extent that he can make the point of our greatest failure the seed of a tremendous future. He can do that. It's Jesus is trying to blow frames of performance out of the water in a highly works-oriented culture and religious context. He's trying to say, look, this is what my father's really like. Scripture says God is, looks for those who look for him. How many of you, when you look for some, okay, fathers, when you got married and you were courting the girl, the babe. And when you were looking at her and looking for her, would it, didn't it warm your heart to notice she was already spucking you out? Amen. They're always looking. 
We just, we just had the Toronto Raptors win the NBA championship. And I was telling Pastor Billy, who's back after two weeks in seminary, and his brain is fried right now, so it's just, uh, but, but he's got a lot of it, so that's okay. I was at Whole Foods doing study. Why would anybody want to go to Whole Foods to study? And in the bar area was filled with Iolani people cheering for Toronto. I was cheering for the Warriors. And the reason why is a son of Iolani, Derek Lowe, who's in our church, his teammates named Bobby Webster, who's the general manager of the Toronto Raptors, who with the owner Ojiri was the one who signed Kabai Leonard. I just lost the women, I can tell. <laughs> All right. And so Hawaii won the NBA championship. Now, why did they just say that? I have no idea why I just told that story. There was a reason for it, see? <laughs> if I had Billy Lyle's brain cells, I would remember how I was trying to make the connection. But I just needed to get on that off of my soul. How many of you were Warriors fans? How many of you were Toronto Raptors fans? Okay, how many of you don't care? Okay, I'll move on. Humility before God leads to connection with God. Well, let me tell you what. No Middle Eastern father would be looking. No Middle Eastern father would run and make an approach to a wayward son. No Middle Eastern father of that day would hug their son and kiss their neck and express affection, give them a robe and sandals and throw a party. That was unheard of. Jesus taught this intentionally to express to us how our Father in Heaven really is. And you need to know that, that if you've failed, if you're ashamed, know that God loves you no matter what. And he, he begins to tip you. He says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, as if the lack of performance now would de-son his status. And that's where we're we need to be careful that we don't dip into condemnation. Because condemnation, God is never into that. So here's the second thing we look at is confession leads to restoration and reconciliation. Humility will breed a confession, the admission of a truth of something done wrong. Confession leads to restoration and reconciliation. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. This is, I've sinned against God the Father, and I've, sinned, and I've sinned before you. So there's a horizontal confession, heaven and earth. The amazing thing here is we see that the son in this story is restored and reconciled, but he's also rewarded. Now that's really, really weird. It's one thing to restore and reconcile. It's another thing to reward. He gave, the father in this story gives his youngest wayward son, the blessing accorded normally to the elder son. In Near Eastern culture, the elder son had a double portion or twice as, twice as much as everyone else. The robe, the sandals, the kiss, the hug, the party. This was a reward for rebellion, it would seem. And Jesus is almost exaggerating as he tells this sore story to create a context that breaks the mindset of performance and works and striving. He's saying, our Heavenly Father is not this way. That if there's humility and confession and contrition, He's about restoration and reconciliation. And He wants to bring you to the place of prominence, of where you belong that has to do with who you are and your future. And all of us here this morning, we need to understand from God's word what our heavenly father is really like. There's two concepts here. There's mercy and grace. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve as sinners. We are all, we were born into this earth as sinners. We are born with the nature of sin that causes us to sin from the fall in the garden that we looked at when we started this series. We have inherited that. Well, what we deserve, therefore, is God's wrath and judgment. But because he sent his son who took upon himself that wrath and judgment, he does not give us what we deserve for all of our failures. He gives us mercy. Then you flip it. He gives us 
what we don't deserve, and that is grace for our failure. And that is God's unmerited blessing. Think about that. The two concepts of mercy and grace are pictured as part of the heart of our Heavenly Father. So let's move on. Therefore, because of what Jesus did for us, Father God will not hold our wrongs against us because of what His Son has done for us. He will not hold our wrongs against us. The great Apostle Paul, who, who before he met Christ, put Christians in prison and his authority put hundreds, history tells us, to death and execution. When he came to Christ, he utters this, he utters this, he implores this young church that was struggling with all kind of perverse failure. He says, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him or through him, we might become the righteousness of God. He was talking to the Corinthian church. You look at the New Testament, first and second Corinthians, that was a screwed up church. In fact, if you look at all the epistles in the New Testament, it was problem solving. And this apostle Paul, who would live a life of sin, thinking he was doing right, is imploring this church to look at Jesus. Think about it. He sent his son Jesus, all right? Jesus received what we deserved, and he's given us what we don't deserve. Now, he became sin, we became righteous simply because he took upon himself the penalty and the burden and the weight and the wrath of God for us. That's the awesome love that our Father has for us. But this righteousness, this we are justified, this is the term that's used here, the word justified means made righteous, given righteousness that's beyond us, just as if we've never sinned. Think about that. How do we receive that? Not by works, not by effort, not by behavior, not by even coming to church. Coming to church is good, but it must follow our relationship with God that's received by faith. Faith, believing in Jesus. It's an intentional choice. All of us are made in God's image, therefore all of us are made with that kernel and ability to believe in our Creator. And that's why he sent his son. Look here at Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. If you confess, the great apostle Paul writes, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the, with the heart, one believes and is justified or made righteous, imputed righteousness that we don't have in our own self. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him who believes in him will not be put to shame. Now, we're going to close with this. All the men are going, Father's Day special, pastor's preaching fast, we're going to leave early and eat lunch. Good deal, shortest message I've ever been in. Don't cheer too early. It's, it's a long final point. An eternal family reunion lies ahead. The journey of family does not end here. It ends in heaven. That's where it happens. This life, Scripture teaches, is only probation and preparation for the real life to come that will last for all of eternity, where time ceases to exist. We live in an epoch of time that's measurable time because of the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden eons of years ago. Since then, all of Scripture points to the coming of Christ, who He is and what He gives us, and what we do with Him. And we're here this morning to understand that there's an exciting reunion ahead. You know, my father, two and a half years ago, passed at the age of 88. He heard the gospel, whether he liked it or not, all his life married to my mother, at least that is, because my mother was a believer, and of course, you've heard enough about my mother. She's a strong woman, and she tried to get the gospel to him. In fact, I think she attacked him with the gospel. And sometimes that was counterproductive. But in his final months, especially when he got real bad because he, he could only be tube fed, he couldn't move, he had a massive stroke, he was essentially paralyzed. I visited with him, and I wanted to make sure 
that I would see him again. So I shared the gospel with him. And I said, Dad, this life is not all that there is. On the other side of receiving Jesus as your Savior, there's a place called heaven. I said, Dad, you can eat miso soup because he would, you know, he wanted to eat miso soup. He craved, he would only, he could only eat applesauce being tubed into him. It was awful. And I, and I remember he still had a fair, he could grip my hand. And I said, I said, Dad, if you receive Jesus, I'll see you on the other side. Because this life is not always, is not all that there is. And so I, I prayed with him. I said, Dad, repeat after me. And of course, he couldn't talk. But I said, if you prayed that in your heart and you understood everything, squeeze my hand. And he squeezed my hand and squeezed himself into heaven. You know, when, 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 the, when Jesus was crucified, there was a thief on the cross. Two thieves, one on, one on the right, one on the left. One of them cursed him. The other one believed in him after rejecting him. And all he said as an expression of faith was, remember me. He looked at Jesus and he said, remember me. And Jesus recognized saving faith. And he said, today you will be with me in paradise. That's what happened with my father. I didn't know Jesus, but he squeezed my hand. I'm looking forward to seeing him again because here's what witnesses say who've been to heaven and returned. God's allowing more of those people. The first people you see upon entry through the gates of heaven, and there are gates in heaven. The book of Revelation says it's made of pearl. Pearl side. <laughs> Is your family members. They're the ones who greet you. But not all your family members. Only those who have believed in Jesus. While they lived on earth. So the first thing that happens upon entry into heaven. As the family journey culminates. Is a family reunion based on faith. Those who believe. Now. The reunion. However. There, there's a couple reunions. There's the first one. Well, for those that are alive and remain when Jesus returns. Because the second coming of Christ, the parousia, is coming. We may be living in the generation today that will not die until Christ returns to the earth. We understand when he returns to the earth, ultimately, this earth will be scorched by fire and remade into a new earth and there'll be a new heavens and the heaven that's now in the third heaven will come to earth and so we get the phrase heaven on earth you need to go through our discipleship track as we break down that teaching so we encourage everybody to do that to grow in your faith so you get understand more of the bible okay but when Jesus comes back look at what's going to happen the great apostle Paul writes we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring those with him those who have fallen asleep. So get this. If you are fortunate enough, if we're fortunate enough to be alive when Jesus comes again, he's going to bring everybody who's believed, who's ever lived in every generation with him, and the sky and the heavens will be filled with everybody, even the uncle you didn't like who received Christ and you didn't know it. Yeah, even Auntie Fala Sing Sing who gave you a bad time as your Catholic school teacher and slapped your hands. She came to Christ and you didn't know it. They'll be coming. And you'll be caught up in the air to meet them. But what about those of us who pass from this, like my, my father, where do they go? They're in heaven. They're in heaven, a heaven that is not yet descended on a new heaven and a new earth. They're in heaven. And so when we pass, we go to be with them in heaven. And they are there by account of every witness to greet you at the gates of heaven. And that is where the journey of family culminates.
2002, three-year-old boy named Colton Burpo had an appendectomy that went south. Complications arose, and he passed. But then he lived again. It became the subject of a New York Times best-selling book called Heaven is for Real. It landed on the New York Times bestseller list for over three years. Unheard of. He was put on every major network, secular and religious, because there was evidence he really went to heaven. It became a major motion picture. It took $12 million low-budget film. It took only $12 million to make the movie. It yielded in profit over $100 million. Colton's daddy was named Todd. He was a pastor. And when you have a New York Times best-selling book and a major motion picture that reads great profit, guess what? You get rich. He refused to take a dime from the movie or the book. Let me be honest. I think I might have said, what about 5%? <laughs> but he said, I, when you understand what my son went through and the trip he took, you don't have the heart to do that. What you're going to see now is a bit of an update. You're going to see Colton when he's young, then 13 years old, and then you're going to see him more currently as he is today, closer to where he is today. So the scene will change. You will see the preview of the movie trailer transition into an interview on the 700 Club, which, by the way, is a fabulous, fabulous show on Major Network, and then an interview in a church. Heaven is for real, and you're going to love it. Take a look. Yes, Colton. Did you know I have a sister? You didn't know that Cassie's your sister? No, I have two sisters. You had a baby die in your tummy, didn't you? Honey, who told you I had a baby die in my tummy? In heaven, this little girl came up to me. She told me she died in your tummy. We need to get him in surgery right away. The pain that I suffered watching my son that close to death. We're in trouble here. He's much worse. Will you call some friends and pray for him? The hospital staff said that your son was not expected to survive. Use the word miracle. Your son had a near-death experience. He saw things that I can't really explain. I lifted up and I looked down. Mom was in one room, you were in another room yelling at God. He's been out there staring for hours. Is something wrong with Colton? Why do you say that? Sometimes he says weird things. I have been here. I don't think we've been here before, pal. You're the grandpa named Pop, right? They died when I was about your age. He's very nice. You saw my grandfather? Where did you see him? In heaven. Is this him? Is this the man you saw? No, in heaven, everybody's young. Is this him? Yeah. That's who, that's Pop. What did, what did Pop look like? He was a young man in his late 20s, early 30s. That's what everybody looks like in heaven. I, I'm, I'm liking that. Yeah. <laughs> so you look like your young self. But you met children, too. Yeah. yeah. You know, are, are they going to grow older? Are they? Yes. Like, if you were miscarried or if you died as a kid, what you do is you will still grow to your prime, but then once you hit your late 20s, early 30s, you stop and you stay at that age. Todd, how did you know he had actually met Pop? When I was a little kid, he, we were so close. He started telling me about things I did with Pop when I was a kid and how nice Pop was. But when he could talk about things I did with Pop, I was like, how do you know that? Well, Pop told me. So I'd take him to pictures because I, I wanted to get a description of Pop and he couldn't recognize him as the pop that I knew at 61. But my, it finally dawned on me with the descriptions he gave us of his sister, how she looked a lot like Cassie, but not quite as big. It was like, well, that's what I'd expect her to look like this side of heaven, except with wings. But so eventually I said, okay, mom, do you happen to have a picture of pop as a young man? So she sent me one and this took a while to get it. I just hand Colton the picture. 
And no, and I had never at, at any time, uh, uh, had he ever seen this? This picture was one that was put up in a closet before he was born. And I just said, Colton, take a look at this. And it's a family picture. We have it in the book. And without even hesitating, Colton just stops and goes, hey, how did you get a picture of Pop? Right off, just like that. Wow. Now, there's no drugs, no teacher, nothing that could have spurred that memory. The only thing that could have answered it is he saw him. Well, Colton, something else came where you, you met a sister you had never met before. Tell us about that. Well, she actually met me at the gates of heaven. She just ran out and hugged me. At first, I was like, who are you? And then she told me who she was. But back when I was three... I didn't like hugs, so... <laughs> How'd you know it was your sister? She's the one that told me who she was. Mm -hmm. I had no idea who she was. What did everyone there have in common? Well, everybody in heaven, they love Jesus. And some people ask me, well, don't, doesn't everybody go to heaven? No. The people that love Jesus are the ones that get to go. And when I asked Jesus, well, how do you get to heaven? He answered with, Colton, if you love me and follow me, my dad's okay with that. You can come to heaven. Now understand that conversation takes place when he's three. So Jesus is talking. Interestingly, Jesus doesn't tell him, oh, if you just believe in me or the man upstairs. He says, if you love me and follow me. Because real faith creates real followership. A lot of people say they believe in Jesus, but there's no fruit of it in their lives. When you really believe in Jesus, there is a fruit that causes you to love him. And if you love him, you follow him. I've been married to my wife for 39 years. I followed her for 39 years. I know, it should be the other way around. Okay, but how many of us men know we follow our wives? 18 honest men in here. Okay. The other thing that's interesting about this is Colt, it's not featured here, Colton, he was, Colton was asked, among others by Megan Kelly of Fox, she's no longer with Fox, he said, how did you come back? He says, my father's prayers brought me back. But Pastor Todd Burpo confesses that it was a cursing, cussing, angry prayer. How many of us know pastors cuss? My staff knows that. <laughs> yeah, you guys are going, okay, here's the thing. God loves honesty. God loves transparency. God sees the the architect passed the architecture of words into the sincerity of the heart because you're still talking to him. He already knows what you feel. He already knows what you fear. He already knows what you think. But when you express that to him, it's called prayer. And that prayer brought his son back from the dead. That's what he said. And sometimes we think, well, I got to do things just right. I got to say things just right. I won't say it. I've got to serve this way just right or else I won't do it. God doesn't think that way. He takes us in our messes and accepts us for who we are. Don't you love that about our God? That's the heart of the Father. Now, he was also asked, Megan Kelly of Fox said, how has this changed your life? I mean, goodness, how are you going to live now? He said, oh, that's easy. He says, I have dedicated the rest of my life to make sure everybody gets to heaven. Because not everybody will. You know why this church exists? You know why I'm in the ministry and Pastor Kalai and Pastor, you know what, Pastor Billy, you know why we do what we do? Because we could be doing other things and making money, lots of money, like lots of you. It's because the most important thing to us is that people get to heaven. And they find Jesus on earth and fulfill their purpose for which one day they'll stand before God to give account for. There's nothing more important than that. 
On this Father's Day as the father of the church, let me tell you that on most days, I get up thinking about people far from God and how we can get them near to God and to know God. I will do anything for that. That's why we're alive. And our Father, He loves us so much, He's made it so easy. He sent His Son. And all we need to do is believe on Him, receive Him by faith, and He gives us the strength to follow Him. Would you bow your heads with me? On this Father's Day, with our heads bowed, in honor of our Heavenly Father who gave Jesus His Son, to give us access to him as dad. It's faith. And you're here this morning. And if you were to pass, you're not sure whether you would be in heaven. Today you can be sure. Because it's not by our behavior, our works, our pedigree, or even coming into a church building. All of that matters to some degree. Coming to church only matters if first we believe in Jesus and have surrendered our hearts to him by faith. So I'm going to give an opportunity to do this. Let me be very clear. As I lead us, with our Heavenly Father looking, in a prayer of receiving Jesus by faith and responding to what is known as the gospel, I'm not talking to Christians who are sure of their faith and their future. I'm talking only to those of us here in this room that are not sure, because if you're not sure, you're not saved. Once you come into a faith bred by the Holy Spirit, you'll have a peace, you'll know. And then I'm also talking to those you know you have never received Jesus into your heart. We're going to secure that today as our first step. Those that are already Christ followers, I'm going to ask you to pray out loud with me a prayer of faith I'm going to lead the first timers or the people that are not sure in. They will pray in their hearts these very words. But those of you that you know you're already Christ followers, to encourage them, will you pray out loud with me? And those of you that are making this profession for the first time, you pray in your heart. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus. I believe you are God's son. I believe you died for my sins and you paid the price for me. I believe you rose again, breaking the power of sin, removing the penalty of sin for me. Lord, come into my heart. Be my father. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Today, I surrender to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, with every head still bowed, Saturday night, we had 15 people respond. In the first service, 15 more. In this service, there may be more. Scripture encourages a public confession when possible of faith professed in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And you prayed that prayer. I'm not talking to the Christians already. I'm talking to first-timers and those that weren't sure. On the count of three, can you lift your hand up, leave it there for a second, and put it down. One, two, three. Up high, all right. Right, I see that. I see that. Looks about the same amount. Looks like another 15 people. How about a hand for these who received the Lord here? You talk about a Father's Day gift. That's the ultimate Father's Day gift. Now I want to say that you're going to hear Pastor Kalai come back up about your next steps to develop your faith. That is so very important. But I want to pray a second prayer. So I'd like for us to go back into prayer for just a moment. Father, so many of us cannot get past our past. 
because of a lack of performance or failure, whatever it may be, sin, shame, and guilt because of things done wrong. Father, I am praying today, as we've seen through your word, that you would lift the heaviness of condemnation about things that were done in the past, knowing that our acceptance does not depend on our performance. And it has nothing to do with what we've done bad, but it has everything to do, Jesus, what you've already done for us that's good. And so, Father, I pray for a refreshing embrace of your hug and your kiss on everyone that's here. Everybody that's in this room, Father, my prayer this morning is they would leave with a sense of your embrace, your love, your acceptance, your healing, your presence, and your peace and your strength for the journey. And I pray this, and we pray this together in the name of Jesus. And can we all say it together? Amen.